Subnetting sucks at first. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. However, see what I did there? It doesn't have to be as complicated or as painful as it first appears. Just as a way of background, subnetting is a strategy for breaking down large IP networks into smaller, easier to manage networks. This is helpful for the purpose of separation and segregation for security purposes, or to simply add additional networks because one network usually isn't enough anymore. Since subnetting is all based on binary math, a lot of people's eyes just tend to glaze over, but for people who are good with pattern recognition, it doesn't have to be as difficult as it first appears. By using pattern recognition, subnetting has a lot of shortcuts, life hacks, tips, and tricks to make it a lot simpler, even if you're just doing all of these calculations in your head. That's why today we're going to be showing you how to answer every single possible question you could possibly be asked on an exam related to subnetting. So close out Candy Crush, silence your notifications because you're watching Brain Melt University and today we're teaching you everything about simple subnetting. One of the most frustrating things about subnetting is that it's a mathematical process and a lot of people just aren't that into math. As with any math problem, you need to have certain amounts of information in order to be able to answer the problem. Just like any math problem that has not enough information as one of the possible choices, subnetting also requires certain bits of information in order to be able to answer any of the questions that are asked of you. That's why I came up with a process that I call the subnetting order of operations in order to help you locate all of these little pieces of information you need to be able to subnet and how to put those little pieces of information to use if you actually have to solve a subnetting problem. So let's go ahead and take a look at the subnetting order of operations. All right, so here we are at our handy dandy order of operations worksheet. And this just kind of gives you the general flow of how you're going to work with your information. So the first little step for subnetting is every subnetting problem starts with an IP address. So this IP address, if you remember correctly, is always going to have two halves. It's going to have a network portion and it's gonna have a host portion. Your network portion is usually gonna be identified by one of two ways. It's either gonna be identified by CIDR notation which is this little slash followed by some number between one and 32, although you're almost never gonna see a slash notation smaller than eight, or it's gonna be identified with a subnet mask, which does the exact same thing, but it actually writes out the number of network bits in decimal form using the same basic format as our IP version for address. So if we were to write out this subnet mask, double two five five two five four in binary, it would look something like this, which shows where our network bits end and our host bits begin. So these are pieces of information that are absolutely vital. If you don't have both of these, whether it's an IP address and a CIDR notation or an IP address plus a subnet mask, you cannot answer any subnetting questions about it. You're just flat out can't do it. So every subnetting problem starts with this. Now let's go ahead and start working through our subnetting order of operations. So the first thing you always want to do is identify the class of IP address. And I know what you're thinking, but we're subnetting. We are in classless IP addressing. Why do we care about the class of the IP address if we're just doing CIDR notation? The answer for that is that we are borrowing host bits to create additional networks. That is what subnetting is. And every IP address always starts with an inherent number of bits based on its class. So if you remember from our IP version 4 video, if you were unlucky enough to watch that, I'm probably going to redo that at some point. Every class A IP address has a subnet mask of 255.0.0.0, meaning that eight bits identify the network portion and the remaining 24 bits identify the host portion. So we are not allowed to go any smaller than a slash eight if we have a class A address. If we try and go smaller than a slash eight, then we're not subnetting anymore. We're actually doing something called supernetting, which is completely beyond the scope of this video. So just remember that if you're subnetting, you're never allowed to go smaller than the number of inherent bits that are offered by your class. Now, just to continue that on, your class B address always has a double 255 subnet, which means a slash 16. You cannot go smaller than a slash 16 if you're doing CIDR notation with a class B, and a class C is a triple 255 or a slash 24. You're not allowed to go smaller than that. Identifying your class is extremely important because it helps you identify the number of bits that are inherently used for networks. So we have to go with a larger CIDR notation than whatever one of those three classes is, whether it's a class A, B, or C. 
So in this particular IP address that we're using for our example, 10.10.64.0, then this starts its life as a class A address. So we go ahead and identify that. And as I just went through, all class A addresses inherently have eight network bits. So those eight network bits are off limits to us. So we'll go ahead and identify those. Now we need to identify the number of borrowed bits. So this is the number of host bits that we are turning into additional network bits in order to create additional subnets, also shrinking the number of hosts that can fit on each of those subnets. So in this particular example, we're using 23 network bits, but since we're a class A, eight of those are off limits. So to identify our number of borrowed bits, we just take our CIDR notation and we subtract our number of inherent bits. So this is a 23 minus eight equation. So 23 minus eight equals 15. Simple subtraction math so far. And that's what a lot of subnetting actually comes out to is very simple mathematical equations. It's just figuring out what mathematical equations you actually have to run against a specific problem. Now, sometimes you'll also run into subnetting problems where they'll give you an already subnetted address and they'll ask you to subnet it further. So in instances like that, so say for instance, we were given this slash 23 and we need to create additional networks out of it. 23 would be that inherent number of bits. And then whatever our new CIDR notation that we put over the top of that would be what we subtract from those inherent bits. So just muddying the waters a little bit, but it's the same basic process. Just identify how many bits are off limits for you to work with. And then your remaining number of host bits. So if we have a 32 bit address, all IP version four addresses are 32 bits, we simply take the number of network bits and subtract that from our total number of bits. So if we're using 23 bits out of a 32 bit address, how many are left over for our hosts? And so 32 minus 23 is nine. Again, simple subtraction process. Now here's where it gets a little bit murkier. So our working octet. So our working octet is going to become important when we actually get to math problems, but when we're identifying it, it's not immediately apparent what the working octet does. So bear with us here, we'll keep moving through here. So when we're talking about a working octet, we are talking about what octet is actually going to start incrementing every time we move to a new subnet. And so your working octet in its simplest form is the octet where your final network bit occurs. So here I wrote out a slash 23 subnet mask in binary. So this makes it a lot easier to identify. So in this example, the last network bit, the final one in our subnet mask occurs in our third octet, which means that this is our working octet. If we moved up to a slash 24, our third octet is still our working octet. But if we moved to a slash 25, now our final one occurs in the fourth octet, which means it would be a fourth octet is our working octet. So just keep that in mind. Your working octet is whatever octet your final zero occurs in. So now that we have all of these pieces of information, we finally have enough that we can start answering subnetting questions. And so below this variable section, we have the math problem section. And this is every possible math problem you could be asked related to subnetting. So a really common question you're going to be asked is how many new subnets can you create by moving from beginning point to end point? So say how many new subnets were created by moving from a standard class A address to a slash 23. So to calculate this, we simply take the number two because we're working with binary math. Everything is either a zero or a one, which gives you two possible options. And we just start multiplying by the number of subnetted network bits or in simpler terms, two to the power of borrowed bits. So we just go in here, we find our borrowed bits and we have 15. So our answer is two to the power of 15. Now, two to the power of 15, I'll go ahead and do the math for you so you don't have to, but once you start getting into numbers this large, you're probably gonna have to use a calculator at first, but a lot of network engineers eventually just get these numbers burned into their brains. And so this particular problem, two to the power of 15 is, 32,768. Feel free to fact check me on this one. So by moving from a standard class A address into a slash 23 address, we created 32,768 unique subnets in that network. So a pretty massive number of networks. So another question that you can be asked pretty often 
is what is the block size of a network? So the question of block size is what is the total size of each of these 32,768 subnets? So they want to know how many IP addresses are in them. Now, this doesn't mean how many valid host addresses when we're talking about block size. That's something a little different, and I'll talk about that in just a few seconds. But your block size is the total number of addresses within a subnet. So this one is pretty easy. This one is just taking, once again, the number two and multiplying it to the power of our number of host bits. So we're just identifying total number of addresses in a network, so our host bits gives us that same basic mathematical calculation. So in this case, we have nine host bits. So we just take two to the power of nine. Now, if you wanna grab a calculator and solve this, feel free to pause the video and do it. Or if you have binary numbers burned into your brain, like the poor network engineer recording this video, I'll go ahead and just tell you it's 512. So each of those 32,768 networks can fit 512 total addresses in each of those networks. All right, the next calculation is pretty easy as well, and it is how many valid hosts can you fit on each of these networks? You might also see them referred to as valid nodes or usable nodes or some combination of those terms. But there is a problem with each of these subnets. We need a way of identifying the actual network that these devices are on, and we also need to have some way of reaching every single device within these networks. So there are two addresses within each subnet that are unusable. It is the very first address in that subnet, so that identifies the network itself. We also don't use the very last IP address in each subnet. This is reserved for what's called a broadcast address. So if you send a message to the broadcast address, every single computer in that network will get it, and every single computer will actually listen to and possibly respond to that message. So we never wanna give any computer within our network an IP address that is also the broadcast address. We also don't want to give them the network address, otherwise nothing's going to listen. Thankfully, most operating systems are trained to identify the network and broadcast and just won't even let you do that. However, not all operating systems are that smart, so you have to be able to make that distinction for yourself. So by subtracting these two IP addresses, the very first and the very last, we come up with the total number of valid IP addresses in a network that could be assigned to some sort of device in that network. So in this case, it's a simple matter of just taking your block size and subtracting two. So if our block size is 512, subtract two, that gives us 510 valid IP addresses for that network. So next we have the magic number, and the magic number is quite possibly the greatest shortcut that was ever created for helping you subnet. And this completely takes out the need for you to break everything down into binary and to start the process known as anding. If you want to learn about anding, I have an older video on the same topic that I'll go ahead and throw at the end of the video that you can watch and hopefully make it through because the sound quality is garbage. But with all that said, your magic number is extremely easy to identify and it is simply taking the number value of the final network bit in your working octet. So we all hopefully by now know the number values of each of your eight bits in an octet. You have your one bit, your two bit, your four bit, 8, 16, 32, 64, and 128. Each of your octets have those eight number values within them. So that's why you only have a maximum number value of any octet of 255, because if you add 128 plus 64 plus 32 all the way up to plus one, those add up to a maximum of 255. If you need to go higher, then you have to start carrying the one, move that one to the octet before it, and then start counting over from zero again. Basic binary counting out of the way. So we just take the number value of our final network bit. So in this case, we're in our third octet, and our final network bit is our number two bit. So that is our magic number. That is the increment by which we are counting our networks. So our magic number is two. If this was a slash 22, then it wouldn't be our two bit, it would be our four bit. So our magic number would be four. If it was a slash 21, it would be eight, etc., etc. So our magic number is two. We need to count our network address. So to identify our network address, we simply need to take our working octet and then start counting by increments of our magic number. So we start at zero, so zero, 
then two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, all the way up until we get to the point where we exceed the IP address. So let's imagine that we didn't go with a nice round address here. Let's say for instance, this isn't 64.0. Let's say for instance, this is 9.117. So if we're trying to identify the network address that this computer lives on, then we take our working octet, which is our third octet, and we take our magic number, which is two, and we just start counting. So 10.10.0, So by the time we get to 10, we are higher than nine. So we know that it has to be the last subnet. So this particular IP address is on the 10.10.8 network. So the network address is 10.10.8.0. So to identify the first valid IP address, so again, we can't use the network address for a valid host, so we just go with the first IP address after our 10.10.0. So this is where it does pay off to have these written out in binary, at least at first, because your host address is not gonna be 10.10.9.0. You actually start counting with your very last host bit. Remember with binary, you count right to left, not left to right. So in this case, if we turn our first available host bit into the on position, then this actually isn't 10.10.8.0, it's actually going to be 10.10.8.1. So that entire octet after our working octet still counts. And it would be the same if our working octet was our second octet. The two that come after it still count when we're talking about host addresses. So remember, your first valid host is your very last available bit. All right, so the next two questions are also questions you're gonna be asked. And this is, what is the broadcast of your network and what is your last valid host of your network? But it's usually easiest to find your broadcast and last valid by doing a simple subtraction problem. So in this case, our first valid was just adding one to our network address. But with a broadcast, we need every single one of our host bits to be turned on. And the easiest way to do that is just to identify the start of the next network and subtract one. So our next network, we just once again use our magic number method and count up in our working octet to the magic number. So our next network address is going to be 10.10, .10, add our magic number to eight, dot 10 dot zero because remember no host bits are turned on with our network address so our next network is 10 dot 10 dot zero or 10 10 10 zero slash 23 so by identifying our next network if we just subtract one from our network that means that every host bit gets turned on and our working octet gets decremented by one subtract one from 10 dot 10 dot 10 dot zero and our broadcast for our current subnet, the one that we've been working in, is going to be 10.10.9.255. So that is every host bit turned on in this particular case. And then your last valid IP address is simply taking your broadcast and subtracting one again. So that's once again, 10.10.9.254. So that's where subnetting tends to throw people off is understanding that our working octet is good for identifying our network addresses, but our working octet and our magic number don't work for identifying host addresses within a subnet. So that's where you have to kind of switch back into basic subtraction and addition mode. And remember that everything after our network bits still counts for those new calculations that we're working with. So remember what you're being asked for. Are you being asked for a host address or are you being asked for a network address? And so that is every possible question that you can be asked for subnetting. So let's go ahead and try that again. So here's a new IP address for us to work with. All right, so our new IP address that we're working with is going to be 
slash 126 or slash 26, not 126. There's not 126 bits in an IPv4 address. So a slash 26. So our new subnet mask for a slash 26 is going to be 255.192. And so our new binary, we're gonna add three bits here. So this is the new binary for that. So we have 26 ones followed by six zeros. That gives us 32 total bits. So now we just start working through our order of operations worksheet to identify all of our variables. So this is a class B address based off of our leading octet. So if again, if you're not sure how to identify a class A, B, or C, then I have another video on IPv4, which I will throw at the end of this video. The inherent number of bits in a class B is 16. All class B addresses have 16 bits that are off limits to us. So our borrowed bits is once again, our CIDR notation, subtracting our inherent bits. So if we're a slash 26 and we are subtracting 16, that means we have 10 borrowed bits. And then out of a 32 bit address, so if we just take 32 and subtract our network bits, that leaves us with six network bits. And then our working octet, where do our network bits end? And so our very last network bit is here in the fourth octet. So our working octet is the fourth octet. So now let's actually take a look at probably the meanest question you can possibly be asked during a certification exam, during a final exam. This is asking for basically these last three items here, even though it's using different terms. So first valid host and last usable node, your usable node and valid host or some combination mean exactly the same thing. So you'll see mean questions like that where they're intentionally trying to throw you off and think that you're doing different calculations when you're really looking for the exact same information. So keep that in mind that you're going to run into different terms to describe the same process or the same piece of information you're trying to uncover. So if we're trying to answer this question, identify the second subnet, including broadcast, valid, and or first valid and last valid, then we actually don't need to worry about the number of new subnets we've created. We don't need to worry about block size or the number of valid hosts. These are all calculations we can completely ignore for this question. So we don't even need to spend time calculating them. If you want to, you can go ahead and pause and go ahead and calculate them using our calculations that we have here, or I'll go ahead and just solve them here and edit out the solving part so that you can get there yourself. So I'll let you pause. No one paused. All right, so there's our new calculated numbers. So next we need to identify our magic number. What are we counting our increments in to get to each next subnet? So our working octet is number four and our final network bit is in the 64 placeholder. So our magic number is 64. And now to identify our network address, we just take our working octet and we start counting up by factors of four. So we always start with zero. The zero subnet still counts. Some textbooks will say you're not supposed to use it, but there's no logical reason why not to use it. So your first subnet is going to once again be 172.16.63.0. Then we add our magic number. So that's going to be 10 or 172.16.63.64.128.192. And then if we wanna go any higher, we have to increment our 63 to a 64 and start over at zero. So the math problem we're trying to solve specifically is asking for the second subnet, which means that they are after 172.16.63.0. Dot 64, because that's our second subnet. Zero is our first, 64 second, 128. I'm not gonna beat that dead horse anymore. And of course, this is a slash 26 network. They're also asking for the first valid host. So what do we do? We go to this address and we increment our first host bit. So in this case, our working octet and our first host octet are the same one. So our first valid host is going to be 64 plus one. 
So 172.16.63.65 is our first valid host. If we want to identify our next network, because we're also being asked to solve for the last usable node and the broadcast, then it's easiest to just find our next network and start subtracting. So I've already told you what the next network after 64 is, but we just take our existing network address and add our magic number, which gives us 172.16.63.128 slash 26. So if we subtract one from our host address space, our broadcast address for our current working network is 172.16.63.127. So a nice way to check your work to make sure that you've done this right. It's not completely foolproof, but it gives you a pretty instant indication whether you did it right or not. Your broadcast should always be an odd number. You will never have a broadcast address that is an even number. At the same time, your network address will never be an odd number. So zero in this case, we're considering to be an even number. So zero is even, one is odd, two is even, three is odd, etc. So your network address will never be odd. It will always be even and your broadcast address will always be odd. It will never be even. So a good way to check your work there. And then our last valid host, we simply subtract one from our broadcast. So this is going to be 172.16.63.126. So that's it. That is the answer to this question. It's a really long one, which is why I hate seeing this on certification exams, but it also is kind of every little bit of information you could possibly want. So like I said, we were able to skip the calculations for number of networks, block size, valid hosts, etc. And you'll also get a lot easier questions. So you'll sometimes get a question of what is the total number of valid hosts for a slash 26 network. You don't need the IP address to be able to calculate the number of valid hosts or the number of valid networks. You simply need to know how many bits were borrowed and how many remaining host bits are there. So with those, you don't have to go all the way to the end of the calculation tree here. You can just say, if I just have to answer the question, what is the total number of new subnets created? Take our inherent bits, subtract it from our CIDR notation, which gives us our borrowed bits, and then take two to the power of borrowed bits. That's an easy question. You should be able to solve it in 10 to 15 seconds. So not all of these are going to be huge bears of a problem like what you saw here, but this should hopefully give you a pretty good indication of what it takes to solve subnetting problems. So that's really all there is to it. All things said, a 15 to 20 minute YouTube video isn't going to turn you into a subnetting genius. The only thing that's going to get you good with this topic is unfortunately practice. So I highly encourage you to take this subnetting order of operations that I came up with and start applying it to other subnetting problems. There are tons of websites out there that can give you example problems or there's also random IP address generators out there that you can use and you can just go through the entire order of operations and pick out every piece of information you could possibly want from it. But this is going to be a useful skill for you. And if you think that you're just going to get by when you actually get out of college and into the working space by just pulling out your phone every time you need to calculate an IP address, you're very quickly going to lose credibility with other network engineers because this really is a process that you eventually start doing in your head and you can very quickly learn the difference between a skilled network engineer and an unskilled one based on whether they can do these subnetting problems in their head. You might have to check your work, but that's very different from having to have something do this work for you. That's one reason why this is questions that show up on virtually any final exam for any IT related content, any certification exam for any IT content, and it's pretty often a very basic question in any job interview for being able to subnet in your head. So it's a very good idea for you to get good with this now instead of having to get good later when you're on crunch time. Hopefully you found this video helpful. Did I miss anything? Let me know in the comments below if there's something that you would have liked to have seen added to this content. As always, a like and subscribe is appreciated. User engagement is one way that we can gauge the usefulness of our content to our user base and is one way of pleasing the almighty YouTube algorithm so that this video can get recognized 
recommend it to more users and make this channel a growing resource that's available and useful to more users. Additionally, hitting that notification bell when you subscribe is one way of getting a notification every time we post new content on this channel. Until next time, it's been Real, and I hope to see you all here next time on Brain Melt University.